we're doing a ton of things. Uh, one of those things um, is that we do a monthly salon series. And this year, um, the topic is strengthening civilization. So we've had a ton of salons already in that space. This is number 11 already. Um, we asked how to strengthen human biology with David Eagleman and Arvind Gupta. We explored effective counterculture with June Yoon. Our hidden social incentives with Robin Hansen. The trajectory of civilization with Peter Eckersley and a few others. Then the really far future with Anders Sandberg. And we asked last week, oh my God, what we may hope for with the hedonistic imperative with David Pierce. So there's a ton of those salons uh, and the videos are all available on our YouTube channel at Foresight Institute or on our website. And today we're getting practical, <laughs> which is pretty nice <laughs> after such heady topics. Um, and we figure out what we can do right now to strengthen civilization. And I think that, you know, the ecosystem that we live in, which, you know, is the country, but more importantly, really the cities, right? Which is, I think, what most of us define ourselves in, right? It's not so much that I say I'm from Germany, um, you know, but I do, and, and it's not so much that I want to live in the US, you know, but it's really this kind of bubble, you know, that you define yourself with, right? It's really not so much the country anymore, but the cities have kind of become the major kind of point of definition these days, I think. And so I think that getting this right is really important. And I think the city is like this complex, subtle, but really all-encompassing fabric that expands through all of our lives, decides how, how do we spend our resources, how we behave towards the future, and ultimately what we think and how we pass on this knowledge. So it really seems like getting this right would make it much more likely that we get everything else right. And at the same time, The city is really like this map that we once laid upon the territory we live in to help us navigate, but we haven't really updated this map at all to find out what we, to match what we found out about the territory. And we've really used it for so long that we forgot that it's just many maps of the maps that we could have chosen. So it's not really taken into account any things that we found out really. Even though that we, even though we know that driving with a faulty map really leads to crashes. And it's not really that we, like, the main problem is not that we don't know how to do better, right? But the main problem is that we're kind of stuck and entangled and, like, gridlocked in the system that we once created. And we can't really put new good ideas into practice. And change within the current system is really slow, but it doesn't really seem like there's much available space to experiment outside of the system. And that's why I think the topic of cities is so interesting, right? Because it's an experimental space a new blank slate experimental system where we can take the knowledge about what works well and what doesn't and we can experiment and build better. But we don't have to start a new state to do this, right? Or go on the water, which is ideal. I think many of you are seasteading see see supporters. But it seems, uh, it seems hard and challenging. So this one is, I think, a pretty practical and current approach. And Joe, you may disagree with this if you're in the audience. Da, 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 da. You disagree, great, and we're going to have a ton of discussion about this. I'm super glad you're here. But, you know, the best thing is really that, you know, it's, we already have an ecosystem within which we can grow this new emerging ecosystem, and it can be competitive with it. We can grow it within the current state until it may eventually be ready to perform a genetic takeover. So, let's see who here um, lives in an intentional community or in a shared co-living situation. Hands up. Some of you at least, a few hands up up there. Who here has been to Burning Man? Okay, a few hands go up. Who here has been to Ephemeral? Oh, nice, very nice. Who here likes seasteading? Very cool, okay, so you're, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> But, you know, I think many of you here really know that, you know, you already support those experiments in living, right? And many of you here sometimes have a glimpse Of for how it could be and what may be available to us if only we get the starting conditions right. And many of you here have a glimpse of those new maps that we could be creating. And I think that's really exciting. And today we have Mark Lutter and Miu Musukutani here to present us their map of the territory. And Dr. Mark Lutter is the founder and executive director of the Center for Innovative Governance Research, which is a think tank dedicated to researching charter cities, special economic zones, and other forms of political decentralization. And prior to launching that center, um, 
He was a lead economist for New Way Capital, an asset management firm which made early stage investments in charter cities. And during grad school, he consulted on several new city projects and special economic zones and has a PhD in economics from George Mason University where his research focused on charter cities. And he's been published in several newspapers and magazines including City AM, The, the Daily Color and Cato Unbound. And his writings have been translated into three languages. Which are those? Uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Okay. Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Great. Very nice. English, English. <laughs> Maybe UK English. <laughs> the more polite version. Great. <laughs> and Mia is managing partner and co-founder at Frontier Capital Partners, which is a, an Africa-focused investor in real assets, including new cities along with the technology, infrastructure, and real estate that are required to make them sustainable and actually livable. And as co-founders of the Nkwaji City Development, he has built a real estate platform worth of, oh my God, <laughs> 326 million USD and an expected completion value of 1.5 billion USD, starting with an initial 1.5 million invested assets. And he's a member of Forbes um, Africa's 2018 under 30s list of young business persons. And FCP intends to roll out several new city developments across Africa and Asia. So I'm super, super glad to have you two here. I'm really glad to catch the tail end of your US trip. Super excited about that. Um, and with that being said, Mark will give a first presentation for 10 minutes and you will follow and then we're gonna take it to a discussion and prepare some questions and some debate, Joe. Great, okay, with that being said, welcome, Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. So I've prepared a few slides, um, but I wasn't exactly sure what audience I would get, so I'm gonna go off script a little bit. So from a high level, I mean, it seems like most of you are familiar with, with seasteading, with uh, the idea of charter cities. And uh, this, what brought me to my current path was basically two aspects. One, I mean, so I've been in the, the space for a long time and um, I got a little bit, I, I, I found myself going to conferences with a lot of the, the sort of same people at the conferences, which I felt was okay, this is like good, you're my friends, but I, I felt that it, the, there wasn't as much potential space moving forward as there could have been. And then the other thing is about two and a half years ago, I uh, did some consulting work on this um, new city project in Kazakhstan, which was very different from the traditional sort of Bay Area focus on innovative governance on seasteading. This was a real estate developer that had, I don't know, it was like 10 square miles. Um, and they were talking about investments of hundreds of millions, if not more dollars. And the, the, the problem was that they, I was the only economist in the room and so they had hired a bunch of urban planners from um, MIT and architects. And so one discussion happened. Uh, we can put a financial district here or we can put it here. We can have tall buildings or we can have medium sized buildings. And I give what I think is a semi obvious answer, which is it doesn't matter where you put the buildings or how tall they are, how pretty they are. If you don't have a financial, uh, you, if you don't have a legal system that's conducive to major international finance, they're not going to do business here. And the response was, what, no, really? And so I was like, okay, well, huh. And another discussion was, okay, well, we need zoning and land use restrictions to make sure we can create this sort of type of facade community that we want. And so I make, again, what a uh, point that's common to economists, which is, well, zoning and land use restrictions raise housing prices. And the response was, again, no, really? And this was a distinguished professor of economics or of, of urban planning at MIT whose job it was to literally go around and advise governments and advise city projects on zoning and land use restrictions. And so this showed me two things. One, the scale and scope of projects sort of being constructed around the world. And then two, the general advice they were getting from the presumed experts in their sphere. And that one of the things that did was it led me to um, think about uh, and, and found the Center for Innovative Governance Research to try to create the ecosystem for charter cities to broaden the dialogue to bring these different parties together, some of the Silicon Valley entrepreneurial spirit ingenuity with some of these mega real estate projects and hopefully try to supplant some of the sort of perceived wisdom of the MIT urban planners who um, 
uh, don't, in my opinion, really know what they're talking about. And so for a brief history, which you guys probably have a degree of familiarity with, um, I mean, the, the Bay Area has been interested in sort of new forms of governance and in new cities for a while. The, the prominent examples are the Seasteading Institute, which you guys are quite familiar with, and then Y Combinator, about two and a half years ago, they announced that we want to build a city, and then three months later it was, we want to research a city, and now two years later it's, okay, um, uh, we need to hire a new researcher for our researching our city project. And then Sidewalk Labs, which had all of Google, now Alphabet, sort of funding and backing, and they're embarking on this project in Toronto, which is basically let's install a bunch of smart uh, 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 sensors and redevelop a, a sort of former industrial district along a canal, which is a good project and it's cool, but I think it lacks some of the imagination and potential uh, scope and, and really creativity that is available when thinking about these new forms of governance and, and new cities. And one example was uh, recently Tyler Cowen did a uh, right, conversation with Tyler, his podcast with, um, what's his face, Eric Schmidt, who was the former CEO of Google. And Eric said, not a lot of people are building new cities. And so after that, I, I text Tyler and I'm like, hey, well, like, you should let me talk to Eric. I can introduce him to several people building new cities. And I think that sort of shows um, how these projects have been thought of and the, the importance of this sort of broader discussion, bringing in these other aspects that I think can add, okay, the real estate is a very important aspect of a new city, and this is not something that can necessarily be developed from the ground up like a new startup company can. There's certainly a lot of marginal improvements on it, but before making those marginal improvements, it might make sense to understand the full real estate industry and, and how that works. Um, and so the other aspect that's important about charter cities is governance. And so some of you might have seen this map before, right? This is China, here is South Korea, and then this dark blot in the middle is North Korea, with the slight like spot being uh, Pyongyang. And this shows the importance of institutions in economic growth, right? The North and South Korea have the same culture, the same history, the same language, the same basically everything, and yet, South Korea doesn't suck and North Korea is a pretty terrible place. Why? Because 60 years ago they basically had this split that led to institutions that were conducive to economic development in part of it and very against economic development in the other part. And so the idea of, of, of charter cities is using new cities as leverage to create these new forms of governance, these new institutions that can then, on one hand, either help alleviate huge amounts of poverty. And so, for example, China, over the last 40 years, has, has lifted around 800 million people out of poverty, which is largely due to their strategy of special economic zones combined with urbanization. Uh, Shenzhen, for example, 40 years ago was a fishing village with a population of about 30,000 people. It was designated a special economic zone and in the first year of its existence, it attracted over half of all foreign direct investment in all of China. Mind you, at the time, China's population was about 700 million people, so you have this basically formerly backwater fishing village, which suddenly becomes one of the most, um, is now uh, the manufacturing capital of the world. And so that shows how it's possible to use cities as a leverage, especially because when thinking about national level reforms, any reform you're gonna have winners and losers. And if you can identify, the, the, the losers are relatively easy to identify ex ante, and so they come out against the reforms and try to stop them. The, the winners, on the other hand, are often very difficult to identify ex ante, and that's why we see the persistence of bad policies. Uh, a classic example is, is the sugar tariff in the US, where the US pays about twice as much in it, uh, per, uh, uh, for uh, cane sugar than the rest of the world because we basically have a powerful farm subsidy primarily located in Florida that prevents the removal of these tariffs. And so cities, especially on greenfield sites, allow for the negotiation of this greater degree of legal autonomy that can then be used to create or to import good institutions that can lead to some of this economic development. And I think we can split these types of models into two different ones. One is sort of catch-up growth, right? We have a decent idea of what types of institutions work well in terms of achieving, right, if you're a poor country, how do you get to the, 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 the rich country status? And okay, 
property rights, um, economic freedom, and rule of law, and if there's some combination of those, there will be probably rapid economic development and, and catch-up growth. On the other hand, if we're thinking about pushing the frontier, which is what Silicon Valley has traditionally been interested in, the U.S. works reasonably well, but what does it mean to push the frontier and to rethink our institutional uh, set. And so one interesting idea that's sort of been buzzing around recently, uh, Glenn Weil wrote a book called Radical Markets, and one of his proposals is the Harburger tax. And that's basically saying everybody will self-appraise the value of their property. The downside is they have to pay tax on that self-appraised value, which makes them want to appraise it relatively low. The flip side is if anybody wants to buy the property for the self-appraised tax, then they are able, for, for the self-appraised value, then they are able to do so. And this would basically make an, all prices instantly public to drastically reduce transaction costs and increase allocative efficiency. And will this work? Um, I think it probably won't, at least not in the first iteration, but this is a serious challenge to the traditional Western notion of, of freehold property that could lead to some serious improvements of uh, uh, economic development and, and standards of living. And you're probably not going to get this passed in a liberal democracy or tested. And so charter cities offer an avenue for thinking about how can we push institutional change on the frontier to make things better. Um, biotech innovation is another example. The FDA currently uh, restricts a lot of otherwise potentially good um, and, and interesting development of new biotechnology. So if you create a space where there's permissionless innovation, where you don't need to, to spend hundreds of millions of dollars for the approval of a new drug or procedure, you could, might be able to see an acceleration in the development of uh, uh, some of these new drugs and, and technologies. And so one thing that I think is sometimes lost in discussions of charter cities and these new forms of governance is taking advantage of existing flows of populations and existing sort of changes that are occurring in the real world. And so the UN estimates that there will be an additional 3.5 billion urban residents by 2050, which is about 70 million annually. Um, these are hugely concentrated in Africa and in Asia. And uh, Wade Shepard, who's a journalist who's written extensively on these topics, estimates that there's about 200 master plan cities being constructed around the world. One of the most prominent ones, which you might have heard of, is called NEOM. It's uh, the city plan in Saudi Arabia for a half trillion dollars. Uh, Mark Andreessen, Sam Altman, Travis Kalanick are all on the board of advisors. Um, though some of them might leave because of the whole murdering a journalist thing. Most of these cities aren't thinking about governance per se. Most of these projects are real estate developers who see the opportunity to basically build a large real estate development. However, by engaging them on certain margins, I think it's possible to push some of these institutional reforms where Saudi Arabia at least seems to have realized the importance of some of these governance reforms sparked by the example of Dubai. And I, I've been seeing a shift um, in some of the people and how they're thinking about it. They're still not thinking about it on the, the sort of level of Silicon Valley, but by engaging in these projects and by learning from them, I think it presents a step for incremental change in uh, improving governance. And so what is a charter city? A charter city is a... Uh, it's a, a, a new city that has a substantial degree of legal autonomy. And so what this means is, primarily in commercial law, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it takes on average over 50% of per capita income just to legally register a business. And so for imagine if uh, when Mark Zuckerberg wanted to start Facebook, he had to pay $25,000 to register his business. I mean, that might not, like, right, that might lead to Facebook not being created. And so that's clear why that's a, a detriment to this type of investment, this type of entrepreneurship, and this type of economic growth. And so by creating a ideally a blank slate in commercial law, it will be possible to create a best set of practices, make it very easy to register a business online in three minutes. There's a company in Estonia, I forget their name now, um, Nortal, uh, that created the Estonia e-governance system or played a large role in it. You can register a business in five minutes there. They went to Oman and they took it down to three minutes. So the technology exists, the primary barrier is political, and Charter Cities offers a way to get around these political barriers to uh, create an ecosystem that's conducive to economic uh, um, development. And so Charter Cities have these three, real, these three components that are very important to consider and understand. Um, first is real estate. So 
the, the value proposition of a charter city is at its base, it's real estate. It's saying, all right, we're going to develop this real estate and we're going to mix in some governance and that's going to lead to an increase in value because building cities is not cheap and so you need to have a clear value proposition to be able to attract the investment to make these projects realistic and successful. The second is politics. You need to convince the host country to grant you the legal autonomy and commercial law necessary for the governance improvements. And politics is very tricky. Uh, so you need to present these ideas in a way that makes them seem not threatening to make both the content and the presentation being, okay, we're going to help the government achieve their goals. Lastly is governance. And so you need to create this new legal framework within which people can operate and within which it leads to human flourishing. And this is, this is very tricky just because the society is complex and whenever you're creating some new type of governance system from scratch, especially on a large scale, there's going to be some un unintended consequences. And at least for the first generation of charter city projects, I tend to recommend for de-risking them and using existing best practices rather than trying to innovate and experiment on the margins just because the inherent total complexity of them means we should have certain, uh, uh, the first generation should be solid and, and sort of lay the groundwork within which they, they become more politically accepted and we are able to experiment uh, for the, the next generation. And so I think I've already ran over my time, but just uh, briefly, what the Center for Innovative Governance Research is doing is creating the ecosystem for charter cities. And what we see that as bringing together these different groups that are approaching the problem from different angles, creating a platform within which these groups can communicate and then hoping that these groups then see the benefit of these, 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 these relationships that they build and, and being able to execute on the ground. And so entrepreneurs, and, and Silicon Valley has a lot of these uh, in terms of people who are interested in building cities. The technocrats, and I consider myself one, I come from a distinguished line of bureaucrats, um, are, are important because in order to get the political buy-in for these projects, it's important to interact with groups like the World Bank uh, like the uh, International Growth Center who can say, one, these projects aren't crazy, and two, here are some of the technical expertise in terms of best practices in what it means in, in, cre in, in creating a new governance system. The real estate developers who are going to build out the physical infrastructure and play a major role in, in, in sort of coordinating and um, bringing together different groups. The special economic zone experts who um, understand sort of bringing in anchor tenants. And so Dubai, for example, is, uh, has a lot of special economic zones and is beginning to think about how to export their model uh, to different parts of the world. One of their most interesting special economic zones is the Dubai International Financial Center where they realized, hmm, Islamic law isn't particularly conducive to economic, uh, to, to finance. So let's bring in a British judge and a Singaporean judge and create this, this financial center based on common law and that's been replicated in both Abu Dhabi and Qatar, and there's two groups I'm aware of that are basically trying to approach them to figure out how to franchise that model in other countries. And then lastly, the politicians, who are largely a lagging indicator, but ultimately they need to be brought on board to, because they need to approve the projects and, and pass the legislation that allows these, the, the governance reforms to take place. And so with that, I'll end and let Muya give his presentation. Um, so I am the CEO and co-founder of Frontier Capital Partners and um, I guess my holding company, uh, Tebe Investment Management. Um, I'm a real estate developer uh, slash real asset investor focused on Africa, um, right now at least. And I'll be speaking to you about some of my more practical, I guess, experiences um, building a city uh, and what our thesis is, how we hope to execute and some of the, uh, I guess, uh, ways we think this might play out. So, uh, at least looking at, looking at Africa, our broad thesis is basically largely driven by rapid urbanization, uh, sustained long-term econo economic growth, and population growth. So by 2050, 12.5% of the global po population will live in Africa. Um, by 2100, it's going to be in excess of 20%. Uh, some estimates say 40%. So it's gonna be about five billion people potentially living in Africa. Um, urbanization is gonna be increasing during that period. Uh, it's gonna be at least 55% by 2050, 64% uh, and 86% already for Asia and Latin America right now. Um, 
America, sorry, Latin America and Asia. Um, the US currently is 86%, so you can see that Africa and Asia have a long way to go until they get to parity with the US. Uh, economic growth is largely strong across most African countries, but is just nominally higher than population growth, so it could be much better. We believe cities are gonna be driving that trend. So looking at Zambia, where we're building our first city, the capital city, Lusaka, where about a third of the country lives, was about a million uh, human beings in population uh, about 15 years ago. It's now about three million people, so it's almost tripled in size in about 15 years. It's expected to be about five million people by 2030, 10 million people by 2050, um, and by 2100, uh, you know, it's gonna be in excess of 20 million people. So we're looking at like a Lagos or Tokyo size city in the next 80 years from just a million people, you know, at the beginning of the century. Um, so the trend is pretty one directional. It's a, it's a vector, basically. This is what the chart looks like for population growth in Africa. So it was less than half a, million, half a billion people in 1950. It's currently about a billion people right now. Um, and you can see like the most aggressive estimates have it at five billion people. Uh, median is about four, and low end is about two and a half. I don't see the low end happening, so I think the median of about three and a half to four percent is probably most likely. Um, so you're still talking about a third to 40 percent of the world <laughs> being Africans. So it's gonna change the whole demographic of what you think the world looks like, basically. So um, essentially what we see is aggregate consumption rising during that period of time. Um, Increase in demand for food is going to be you know, exponential. Uh, land scarcity is going to be a big issue given the population trajectory, which means land values are also a one directional vector. Um, basically, you can't lose money buying land in Africa. Um, and sustained public sector capacity is weak. Um, so our view is that private actors are going to be the ones to actually drive capacity building. And it's something we can already see. Um, most SOEs in Africa are derelict. Um, most governments are weak, um, but the private sector is actually thriving. Um, so it shows that you know, private incentives actually work and might be the means through which uh, Africa can actually sort of gain some steam in this civilizational crystallization, I guess. So as far as how we intend to execute our strategy. Uh, we're looking at this with the perspective of building effectively a, Shong, a Shenzhen with Hong Kong or Macau characteristics. Um, so those would be special economic zones with partial political autonomy, um, still subject to the host nation state, as is the case with, say, uh, Hong Kong, um, but with their own legal structures and administrative structures and potentially monetary systems. Uh, I'll get to that later, um, but that last element is probably the hardest to sort of negotiate for. Everything else is pretty standard uh, within the context of special economic zones. As far as the moonshot, um, you've all seen the, the chart now. It's pretty one directional. Um, so the idea is building a network of cities that could at the very least hopefully um, cover 10% of the city population in Africa by 2100, which would be 250 million people. Um, so it's basically a network of cities which would function as a country. Um, to the extent we can include Asia in that, you know, the numbers look better, but this is extremely hard stuff to actually do, so we'll keep it uh, relatively less ambitious. <laughs> um, so we see things in two, um, I guess, ways. A, the foundations are the governance issues that Mark's already spoken about. Um, the second issue that needs resolving is the economic problem in that um, you know, one of the reasons that most people move from one city to another is because they're chasing an opportunity, right? And it's one reason why people migrate within countries. Uh, it's one reason why people migrate across countries. And so to the extent that you're developing a city, you also have to think about what the economic attraction is. Um, and so the standard tools typically used by, uh, you know, charter cities in the past, at least the government-run ones, so SEZs basically, are largely liberal labor laws, um, uh, favorable governance systems, and low taxation. So that's your standard toolkit. But you sort of also need to add to that an economic platform that people are attracted to. 
Um, and this will differ from city to city because each geography has its own uh, comparative advantages, but that's something that a city developer needs to take into consideration when considering where to site a city um, or how to attract people. Um, so some of the newer cities that have been built in places like Africa are typically uh, servicing things like mining operations. So there's some large mining outfits in Africa run by uh, typically Canadian companies like Barrick Gold or uh, First Quantum Minerals. Uh, largely digging copper from the ground and, and processing it and selling it on global markets. But because these cities are typically, these mines are located in the middle of nowhere, say in the Congo or in Zambia or uh, even in Panama, um, there's nowhere for the staff to live, right? And so they have to build a whole new city to enable the staff to actually live there. Um, and so this is something we've seen most recently in Zambia. And right now in Panama, there's a city being built for a mine run by first quantum minerals. Uh, which speaks to the idea of an economic attraction. So the mine is the economic anchor or the, uh, you know, the anchor tenant in a sense because the whole supply chain that feeds the mine is then sited there. Um, so to the extent you're developing something sans the mine, um, you have to figure out what you're going to do. Right? So there's different ways you could solve for that, uh, but that would differ from project to project. In our case, there's a couple ideas we've um, thought about for our first city. Uh, one is education. Um, so typically a lot of people will move to college towns, right? Um, and so if you think of Cambridge in the UK, um, it's a college town, but there's a large ecosystem that has been developed around the, the large university. So that's one way of achieving that. Um, so what I'll do is I'll show you some pictures of uh, what we're doing. This is a dam wall uh, we were building last year um, for a reservoir um, that's supposed to feed the city with uh, the water that they need. So this dam wall is basically now complete and that's what it looks like now with the lake behind it. Um, so that's about two billion liters of water um, behind the wall. Um, these are roads we've been building over the last couple of years. So those are streets and that's a satellite view of the estate. So all the lines there that you can see are roads that we're working on. And the, the lake that you saw basically is now behind this little line there. And those are our neighbors sort of copying us. And so when it's finished, this is what it's supposed to look like. Um, so you have a lake, um, a little business district, um, with the shopping mall there on the lakeside and houses behind there. Uh, it's an example of one of the houses, uh, or other house designs, uh, that our residents can use. Uh, that's another example. And this is what our master plan looks like for the city. So it's about 12 square kilometers in size. Um, so it's relatively small, but it's meant to house about 100,000 people when done. And so what we did is we uh, sort of like divided the whole town into districts and suburbs. Um, so we've got, I think, eight or 12 districts uh, and then smaller suburbs within those districts. And the idea is to try and create some heterogeneity within all the little districts. So each little community has its own vibe and its own feel. Um, and that hopefully creates some community spirit over time. Um, so that's the approach we took there. And this last slide shows what the estate will look like as far as like green spaces are concerned. Um, so we've committed quite a lot of land to green space. It's about 200 acres. Um, so along the lake, there's some green space. And then all those little green boxes, you can see also green spaces. And I think that's basically a high level of what we're doing. Um, I think I'll briefly just touch on the whole monetary um, system idea without going into too much detail. Um, one of the biggest challenges that's there in building a city in Africa or in any developing economy is the fact that um, in solving for an economic problem, uh, you can't ignore the fact that there is inherent risk in the money that is used by economic agents within the economy um, as expressed in cost of funds, right? So there'll be a cost of equity if you're an investor uh, in equity or um, the cost of debt if you are a lender. Uh, and typically what you see is that inflation over the last decade has somewhat stabilized um, after all the IMF restructuring that happened in the 90s. Um, 
And so inflation is generally sub 10%, um, which may sound high to you, but it was like in the 40s and 50s and 60s, in the 90s and prior to that, so it's a significant improvement. Um, but still, interest rates typically are above 25%, 20%, uh, which largely means that the larger pool of people in countries are excluded from um, financial, or at least low-cost financial assets, right? Uh, so you go to a bank and ask for a loan um, as a means of uh, you know, gaining access to capital to build a home or buy a home. It's not available to you, uh, largely because you are excluded because you can afford the return uh, cost of that capital. Um, our view is that to the extent that a city is either part of the larger global economy and dollarizes or uses crypto, you can get that cost of funds to come down significantly because the US cost of funds is significantly lower. All right? um, the challenge that's there is that you then have to either be a Singapore type economy that is constantly exporting goods to the rest of the world and therefore is, you know, uh, in, has significant amount of dollar supply within its own economy to um, refinance external debts, um, or you have to have your own crypto economy, for example, with access to the same, but again, you have to have economic actors within your economy that are constantly providing services to other agents willing to take that crypto economy as legal tender, uh, living outside the economy. Um, either way, what happens in both instances is that you can get your cost of borrowing to come down significantly, and that's a huge um, driver of stimulus for local private investment, either by households, right, uh, who would be building uh, their homes or getting small loans for consumption purposes, or small businesses and large businesses which suddenly have access to, again, low cost of funds. Um, and this is fairly important because a high cost of debt uh, also uh, inhibits, um, suppresses valuation markets because your discount rate is significantly higher than it ought to be. Um, so that inherently then forces people to go long on equity and use their savings, which are also shallow. And, and so you're just creating friction upon friction within your own economy um, whilst at a very low base. Um, to the extent that you solve for this, I think what you then create is a, an ecosystem where you could actually then finance your growth um, and sort of like leapfrog a lot of these development markers that typically take longer to do. Um, and so that's a thing that we're thinking about quite a lot. Um, and so we, we think crypto might be a solution to that and we're actively thinking about ideas as to how to solve for that using crypto. Um, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on it. Um, but I think uh, it would distract from the broader conversation here, so I won't really go into that much detail on it. Um, generally though, our view is that to the extent that charter cities actually start working in Africa, we'll probably see a lot more of these being developed in the coming years, largely because they are probably the most efficient ways of getting people out of poverty um, or uh, attracting foreign direct investments um, into Africa because they provide somewhat stable um, rent-free um, domiciles where investors can uh, allocate capital um, to sort of like take advantage of this one directional growth story that we're seeing. Um, yeah, so I think that's the long and short of it. What got you two into both of this? Because you both have a pretty um, different approach to this, right? I, I think. And then how, how, to, how did you two meet? And do you have any projects coming up that are you know, co combining forces? So I got into this. I heard a talk about eight years ago. It uh, referenced very briefly. I think this was before Paul Rumer's TED talk. Um, maybe it was a little bit after, uh, mentioned very briefly Michael Van Naten, who's a Dutch lawyer who is trying to build a free city in Somaliland. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, and then I sort of went down the rabbit hole and got deeper and deeper into it. Um, and I think got moderated a little bit. And now I don't think building a free city in Somaliland is a good idea. Though actually it's sort of being done right now. Um, Dubai Ports World. Yeah. Uh, actually, Somaliland is fine. Somaliland is like reasonably safe and stable. Uh, Dubai Ports World is building a, 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 a port in Berbera, which is a part of Somaliland. And Dubai Ports World is one of the most reputable 
sports companies in the world. I don't know if they have any legal autonomy. I sort of think, assume they do because once you come with a few hundred million dollars of investment in an economy of that size, you can get most of what you want. Um, uh, but that sort of got me down the rabbit hole and then I briefly explained the experiences at the beginning of the talk as to why I sort of switched to focus on the center and building out this ecosystem because I think projects like Muya's are awesome and need more attention. So yeah, I think rather the way we know each other is that uh, about two years ago, uh, I was sort of interested in <laughs> in optimizing our approach to building our, our first town. And so I started doing a lot of research on propriety cities. And every sort of uh, link I saw had his name on it. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, OK, I probably should reach out to this person. Um, so I got in touch via Facebook, and I was surprised that he actually responded, because <laughs> I was a random person from Africa. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we got talking, and uh, here we are. Um, so we've been at this for about four years now, um, and the estimated time frame is another six years, at the very least. Um, so a lot depends on broader economic. One of the reasons why it's happening somewhat rapidly is largely because there's a housing deficit um, in Zambia and across most African countries. And so when we started selling land um, in, the, in the city, it was just bush and we're selling off plan on payment plans. And we sold initially like 3,000 units. Um, and then we had a devaluation and about a third of those disappeared. <laughs> um, but we still have like sub 2,000, so we're still good. Um, but Effectively, it's, it's, a, it's a systemic issue, right? And so there's a lot of people who still want to live somewhere um, because there's population pressure, there's uh, housing pressure, and therefore um, that's sort of giving us momentum. What's a concrete project that you're working on? Uh, so, so my goal is to build out the center, to basically build out the community, because uh, I see a lot of these conversations being had that are siloed, and by unsiloing them, and by broadening the conversation and bringing in different parties, I think it's possible to get um, more action on the ground. And so there's a few projects that are sort of in the books that I can't really talk about on camera, um, uh, but I've seen a pretty good response in terms of the level of interest when these projects are presented in uh, a certain way. And, and getting engagement. Um, and I mean, my, so my personal goal is basically to build up the center for a few years, create the ecosystem, and then move into the for-profit side uh, and, and start maybe investing or whatever my talents take me. But right now, so right now I see the binding constraint to charter cities as political. And so that political barrier needs to be overcome by basically creating a a set of people and a set of institutions that present uh, that present these ideas and such that the content as well as the presentation is in a certain manner that allows them to basically get access to the people who are able to approve them and, and then fund the projects. What are the main obstacles right now? Funding, actually. <laughs> uh, How much would you need right now and what would you do with it? Um, so October will be the first month I pay myself. I launched this about a year ago. Uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and uh, the traction has been much better on all fronts except funding. What would I do with it is basically increase what I'm doing, but sort of, uh, so I hired my first person. She starts a week from today. Um, and then the second person I would hire is a research fellow to basically build out the research arm. We're doing two things, events and research events. We held an event um, here about three weeks ago and the idea behind the events is to bring people together to get them talking. Um, the research is to twofold. One, to create really the base case, what's the base economic, the base philosophical, the base moral case for charter cities to get a really strong core, a strong foundation for these ideas, and then practical research, such as what's the impact of um, doing business on uh, uh, changes in urban land values or looking at the Dubai International Financial Center, Abu Dhabi Global Market, and Qatar Financial Authority and look at how they implemented common law, what their decision trees were, and what the relative trade-offs were at each point in their decision tree to basically try to create a shared set of understanding and best practices that can be used uh, by entrepreneurs like Muya in, um, in, in implementing these ideas in practice. Um, 
I think as far as challenges go, the main one is probably funding as well, because it's a relatively large project. Yeah. So <laughs> um, at the moment, we're self-funded, and I think we're able to execute our mission uh, to the extent we're focused on one city using the proceeds of our, I guess, our, our sales plans. Um, but you know, the broader opportunity is pretty significant, and our feeling is that to the extent that we are bullish about that, which is we are, um, you know, we probably need to actually do a fundraise for that. Um, and we're sort of bootstrapping the expansion strategy in any case by doing things like securing land rights in advance of funding. Um, so right now we're working towards buying like north of um, about 200,000 hectares, so that's about half a million acres of land um, to sort of like do step two. Um, for reference, that's like two Singapores. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. And would you, like, I'm, I'm curious to, because the kind of like media narrative, I think, you know, probably plays a role in, in the fundraising too, right? And I'm really curious about, like, how, if you could dig in a little bit in the Neon case and the recent developments there and whether you think that has any influence on this and, like, what kind of, like, you know, like, what kind of good pitch, like, you, you mentioned, like, the moral case for charter cities, you know, one could really make for this and how, how you distinguish that from what's currently going on. Uh, sure. So I don't think the Neom, like what's going, I think that's pretty unique to Saudi Arabia. Um, like broadly speaking, so, so Neom is a uh, new half trillion dollar, like half trillion with a T dollar project in Saudi Arabia. There is this old new city project called King Abdul Economic City. Um, it's the first city to be listed on a stock exchange. Its price tag was a hundred billion dollars. It wasn't very successful. And so Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman went back and thought, huh, I wonder what went what wrong with this project. I know, it needs to be five times bigger. Uh, and that's Neom. And they do have a very good board of advisors, but uh, I think the project is probably too big and just with mega projects of that size, they're a little bit unfocused and I don't think the expertise exists. It exists, but it, it's, it's basically the search costs are relatively high. And so I, I suspect that they're not going to go down the, the right path. I don't think that will have particularly many implications for the broader, um, these the broader types of projects because Saudi Arabia is a bit unique and they're facing their own unique set of challenges. So I don't think people will perceive that as going down. As to how to present these projects, um, I think this is right like uh, one of the most um, cost effective ways of, of uh, alleviating poverty around the world. Uh, because one, they're self-sustaining once they get off the ground. So these are for-profit business projects. And two, um, I mean, creating the ecosystem, right? Long-term economic growth, the, the give well, um, which famously ranks charities, mostly charities that do, uh, that basically have randomized control trials that are relatively easy to capture the, the dollar, quantified dollar value on quality adjusted life years. They have internal estimates of the value of economic growth and their internal estimate is raising economic growth by one percentage point for one year in a country of 4.2 million people is worth about $70 million. Um, and a project like Muya's has the potential to raise, right, economic growth by two, three percentage points, and that's, I think, conservatively. And it's only 100,000 people, but that's for like, right, 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and so that has a hugely beneficial impact. If we look at what are the most effective, um, like the biggest humanitarian miracles, China's economic growth in the last 50 years. And so um, fighting malaria is good and we should do it, but ultimately to lift people out of poverty, you need growth effects, not level effects. And I think charter cities are a, a, a effective way of doing that. With respect to NEOM, I think, I mean, if one digs into the numbers, I doubt that the total construction cost is actually going to be half a trillion dollars. Uh, what tends to happen is that developers use the completion value. Uh, that probably includes third-party developers actually participating in the platform as, as marketing material. So it's probably maybe a hundred billion dollars. Um, but just do a lot of money, all things considered. Um, that being said, I don't want to sort of disappear, so I won't say many bad things about the MBS. <laughs> uh, you can edit my section. <laughs> um, I actually think that perhaps they're focusing on the wrong thing in Saudi Arabia. Um, and they've perhaps overestimated their uh, reform drive. Um, the thing is, Saudi Arabia is, you know, 
informally known as the uh, the land of the two mosques, right? Um, so the king is called the custodian of the two mosques, uh, which uh, you know really suggests that the cultural heritage there and the idea of being, I guess, the Muslim holy land is fairly strong, right? Um, Dubai, for example, didn't have that sort of uh, identity. Um, Jordan doesn't have that identity. Uh, Lebanon didn't have that identity, and Beirut was like the Paris of the Middle East for a really long time until Dubai sort of took its thunder. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of like doubtful that they could actually execute a tourism-focused um, business plan for Neom, um, you know, full of hedonism, things like that, because the Wahhabis will lose their <laughs> their, uh, their heads. Um, I, I think that would be very, very controversial. <laughs> um, rather, I think if you know, they were to look at what their comparative advantages are as a, a kingdom, it's having a lot of money, right? And so <laughs> I, I think the way to sort of play that is to make Riyadh perhaps a financial center and take away Dubai's thunder as a financial center um, and become an investing hub. And so like the Switzerland of the Middle East, for example, could be a much more realistic play, uh, especially because Saudi Arabia doesn't have tax already, right? So you're yeah, winning on that front um, to the extent that it moderates a lot more and perhaps created a new city uh, with somewhat more liberal um, sort of like laws um, sort of, you know, that the Wahhabis can be happy with, um, but Western investors and other people can also sort of tolerate. Um, <coughs> that's a much more pragmatic approach and probably cheaper. Um, another constraint that they have is that their largest sovereign wealth fund only has like $450 billion of capital, which again is a very large number, uh, but considering that Saudi Arabia is, you know, the Arab Peninsula's largest population, it's not a very entrepreneurial culture, uh, most of the people work in the civil service, um, and at some point the world will move away from hydrocarbons, that means they really need to think about a comparative advantage beyond that, and again, that's speaking to money, which they have in abundance. So briefly, to I, 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 I like Muya's points, but um, additional points on Niam, I think it, it does reflect a good positive trend in the Middle East, because for the last 20 or so years, everybody in the greater Middle East has wanted their own Dubai, and usually they look at Dubai and are like, oh my God, the architecture is so great to get my own Dubai, I just need to hire architects and pay them a lot of money and build crazy buildings, and if you Google Astana, which is the capital of Kazakhstan, you can see what I mean. Um, and. Niam has, I think, begun to realize, and this has been indicative in other projects, but I think most explicitly in Niam, that what makes Dubai great isn't the architecture per se, right? The architect is a cause of, not a consequence of, the, is a consequence of, not a cause of the success. And what makes Dubai great is their, their free zones, that they have um, the Dubai International Financial Center with common law, um, that they've basically figured out this, this mechanism to combine a degree of social liberalism combined with this economic liberalism that allows them them to be successful. And Niam, at least, according to the promotion brochures, has realized this, where women can go around not in niqab, so you can actually attract like a European human capital. I think the, the challenge is that Saudi Arabia is basically already urbanized, it's not urbanizing. And so to fill a city of this size, you're basically filling it with European uh, high human capital talent and uh, South Asian low human capital talent like Dubai, but Dubai's population is like 3 million. Um, and so when hydrocarbons run out, uh, you're going to see a vast shift in population density in the Middle East and embarking on a 40 year project uh, doesn't seem as dependent on basically importing foreign labor, doesn't seem like the right play given the structural conditions of the country. If Saudi Arabia may not be uh, the best spot to implement such a thing, um, or at least not in, in the way that it's currently being tried. Uh, what do you think about California? Um, like, there was a recent post on Slate's Art Codex on, you know, like advocating for, well, California, you know, you, you may you may even try charter cities here, and I think, like, the city of uh, El Cerrito, like, at least in a very kind of, like, let's say, low stakes way, is definitely going for that now in November. So what do you think are the perspectives, you know, like, really close to home for, um, it depends on, uh, I mean, California, if you define charter cities relatively loosely, already has them. Uh, Irvine, California, for example, which is a privately developed city. Uh, sure, uh, Muya actually probably knows this better than I do. Uh, actually, you tell it. 
Um, so in the 1850s or so, uh, a family called the Irvines bought a 50,000 hectare ranch, I think, in Southern California. Um, down the line, a guy called Donald Bren bought it off that family and started to build a, a series of towns there, uh, the most famous of which is, I think, uh, uh, Irvine along with Newport Beach. Um, and so he basically owns the whole of Irvine um, city along with Newport, I think. Um, and, you know, the business is worth something like $30 billion. Um, and it was a master plan community, the university, business districts, and so on and so forth. Um, however, whilst it does have some of the elements of a charter city in the sense that uh, I believe they lease land and sell land as well, um, they don't have private governance structures, so they're still part of a, a, a typical sort of like municipal corporation. Um, so they, they don't have autonomy. Yeah, I think the value of sort of charter city loosely defined um, in California is basically primarily getting along zoning and land use regulations, uh, which are obviously extremely stringent in here and the cause of a lot of the high rents. And there is potentially a value add in that depending on where the land is and what the transportation infrastructure is to getting to um, nearby cities. Though ultimately, right, like, there is a technology that allows us to stack houses on each other um, and building new cities because we can't figure out how to use that technology because our politicians aren't that smart is sort of a end run around, I think, um, some deeper structural challenges that hopefully can be fixed um, first. You don't think it's a good application case here. I mean, the, you know, the resistance to that is pretty strong. It is. It, it might be. Um, I don't know enough, and I don't know. Like, it depends on where the land is. It depends on what the transportation infrastructure is. Uh, I know several people who want to build new cities in California. I don't know that any of them, how seriously they're, they're sort of looking at land purchase and, and have explored it. Um, I generally favor more experiments. Uh, so, like, right, that's sure, let's try it. I'm not sure it's where I would put my money, but again, that depends on all these constraints, which I don't have details for. Uh, do you think, like, we've talked about um, kind of like obstacles, but do you think there's, you know, any, like, what are like the strongest, let, let's steal man this, like, the, the objection, what are like the strongest objections that you get from that, perhaps from a, from a moral side? I think, you know, while it's probably pretty laudable to be trying to do that to the uh, people out of poverty, you know, they, one may advance an argument saying that, well, over the long term, you know, you just enable people um, to move into those cities, um, the ones that, that can at least afford it. You know, the government may retreat more and more um, in terms of their responsibility toward the rest of them. Like, where would we end up there on, over the long term? Like, what are the best arguments that you hear against that? And like, what would you say in, um, to, to come back to them? Um, I mean, typically, I think you just outlined one of the biggest ones, which is that you're building communities for, you know, relatively affluent people and very affluent people um, on the upper end. And that's true, uh, I don't deny that. Um, that's because I'm not the central government, it's their job to fix everything else. Uh, I think there's a governance stack in any economy, right? And so my view is that the, the national government um, and then cascading down regional governments have got the burden of duty, right? Um, to care for the most vulnerable um, because private developers act on incentives to the extent it's not profitable to serve, uh, say, the homeless doesn't make sense to create a private corporation to do so. Um, I mean, it would be nice to do so, I just don't see a path towards that without things like uh, subsidies and things of the sort. Um, but then you're sort of wading into politics. Um, so I think that's purely in the political are arena. Um, and I also think connecting it back to your former question, um, I think that's one of the reasons why it would be hard to execute a charter city in a place like California and that the politics is probably just going to kill it before it starts. So I actually slightly disagree with Muya on the point about it is a sort of frequent objection in terms of uh, building these projects for rich people and I think the first generation of projects are generally going to target the middle upper middle income segment but I think the, the, the most opportunity lies within the low income segment if you look right which company has a larger market cap, Mercedes or Toyota, Toyota, because they build a lot more cars. Uh, and so I think the first $10 trillion company is going to be the company that effectively figures out how to monetize the slums, um, sort of like what Hernando de Soto is work in terms of figuring out how to give property rights to the slums, but figuring out how to be a sponge that can collect 1% of those income gains, and you're going to make a, a shitload of money. And the challenge right now, as I see it, 
is that um, most of these projects, they basically haven't figured out how to mass produce housing uh, for that income segment. But if you can figure out how to, and, and right, you basically, you, because these are real estate projects, you need to present them in a real estate manner to raise that funding. Um, but if you can figure out how to get that price point low enough to basically include the the, the low income people, then they have the highest potential upturn for, for growth. And with charter cities and with that governance structure built in, there there is that potential and you wanna basically hit the biggest market you can. So I, I well, that is a criticism that I hear often. I don't think it's a particularly good one per se. The the steel man of this, I think, is um, there's a lot of arguments like infringing on sovereignty. I don't think these are particularly strong arguments. Um, the, the the strongest argument is I think in turning government into a service, governance as a service. Um, right, you can imagine it it makes it more transactional, and the state currently acts as a social safety net for a large percentage of the population. And I think that's arguably because there's a sort of libertarian argument where uh, we had fraternal societies, we had churches, and then the welfare state replaced them. But the counter argument is that we basically invented modern accounting methods where we could see who the producers were and who the sort of consumers were in the mutual aid societies and in the fraternal societies. And they basically started kicking out the people who were not being productive and the welfare state took in to, came in to take care of them. You can imagine at any given time there's 5% one to 5% of the population, either because of sort of genetic reasons or really deep-seated cultural reasons is going to be unproductive. And you want to figure out how to way to subsidize them to make sure they have some basic standard of living. And if you turn government into this very transactional service, it's not going to subsidize them. And these people are gonna be far more marginalized than they currently are. And I think that's a negative outcome. And that's one outcome that is possible, right? Like what does Dubai do if you're a beggar? It just puts you on a plane and goes home, um, sends you home. And so that's, works if there's one Dubai, but that doesn't work when there's hundreds. And I think that is a serious challenge and one that should be addressed. I think the benefits of charter cities outweigh that in terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of other things, but it does need some serious thought. And I see that as the strongest objection. I actually agree with what Mark just said. I think just to qualify my former point, um, I sort of like segment the, I guess, low income segment into a couple different tiers. So there's the income generating low income segment, at least in Africa. So those are the people who live in the slums. Um, and then you have true homeless people, right? So the part that I think it's very difficult for private actors to serve is homeless people or people who are, um, uh, say, uh, have got mental health issues and therefore are homeless and the host of sort of related um, issues. Um, as far as like monetizing slums, that is certainly possible. And then, I guess, local currency terms in many poor countries, the yields are actually pretty high um, per square meter. And so it seems attractive. The challenge is that the income elasticity of people in the lower end is pretty low. Um, so to the extent that you want to sort of safeguard your return in, in hard currency terms, like US dollar terms, um, and as a devaluation, you certainly have a bunch of people who can afford, so to afford the rent. Right? And so, that's the biggest challenge there. And it speaks to my previous point about things like uh, using alternate currencies to sort of hedge away that risk, uh, because that's the only way we can sort of provide large scale uh, affordable housing for most people, because the primary problem we face is this um, transmission mechanism between local currency risks and sort of like global uh, investor returns, um, because you sort of like have this um, volatility and value on the one hand, and then this need to meet your hurdle um, as far as like total return is concerned on the other end. Um, yeah. All right. Well, before we open it up um, for people, I think one thing that may be interesting for people, especially living in intentional communities, you mentioned, um, you know, like you were speaking a little, a little bit about like the economic kind of incentives then about like the kind of like political system of the charter cities. And then you mentioned in, you know, in the last slides, yeah, you want to kind of like try to at least instill like some like, you know, pocket communities within the areas that you're building. So I'm really interested in like how kind of like, let's say, um, how structured and ideological should those charters be of those cities? Um, and you know, what kind of community values would you instill there if, if any at all? Um. I think our focus is largely aesthetic versus philosophical. So we want the community to actually figure out what values they want to have. Um, what we'd like to do is just create the initial 
differentiation within the sub communities. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, no, no. You are. So is it like similar? I think it's seasteading. Um, I, I, at least the last time, um, like I spoke about, like the a similar question there. It was also the kind of understanding that you kind of create create a blank slate, and then different communities could you know form their individual pockets, and you kind of vote with your feet and go to the one you know where you most align with the values, which is similar to this atomic communitarianism of like, you know, um, which Scott Alexander proposes. And I think, I, I'm just wondering whether, you know, you want to create like blank slates or whether, you know, how, what are you doing kind of like to instill the first types of communities and like, how do you see the governance within those panning out? So we sort of see it in very pragmatic terms, you know, saying things like, don't litter. Uh, if you litter, we'll fine you, uh, punitively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we've got like bylaws that everybody is like, required to meet. Um, we've banned fences on houses, for example, so the idea is um, you can sort of fence the back of your house and the sides, so you have relative privacy, uh, but not the front of your house. Um, so it feels open and so like your neighbors know your face and who you are and you're forced to sort of engage with people. Um, and so like there's things like that we're doing, but we're not being overly prescriptive about these are your belief statements that you must adhere to, um, because we feel like that's not our place. And mostly you sort of like develop those subcultures on their own in any case. So um, our feelings that people sort of figure it out. Um, so we're just like the partners with them in having this story sort of like form and then crystallize over time. Um, we're more concerned with the more pragmatic little elements, which is like don't paint your house pink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Neighborhood Nazis. <laughs> Um, I, I, I agree with Muya. I think in this space there's been a little bit too much focus on, I think intentional communities work um, on small scales, but on large scales it becomes, they're, they're, they're very difficult to scale. And so if you look at the successful intentional communities done at large scales, they're basically religions. So like Utah, Salt Lake City, um, more recently if you've seen Wild Wild Country uh, in, in Oregon, and I think trying to get a large like right 10,000 person plus group of people to move to a certain area that without a clear value like sort of economic value proposition but with a more ideological motivation is extremely difficult unless there's this very strong tie that binds people and i think the economic motivation is sort of more sustainable in the long run and more amenable with this global value system if you go to a country and are like i want to establish a religious community with 50,000 people right the country's not going to let you do that um, and uh, so on a local level, right, you do want to instill certain cultural traits in the community idea that they like, right, a sort of um, value of entrepreneurship, a, a interest in growth and optimism, these, these kind of things, how you do it. This isn't something I put a lot of thought into, so I don't have particularly strong opinions. Uh, but I, I agree with Muya, these should be pragmatic concerns to sort of increase the value of the community, not as a really like, predetermined binding metric for who moves in? Sure. I think that, you know, most of the intention communities that I know, they're not hoping to ever get 10,000 <laughs> members into one community, but it's more like, you know, the characters of the houses are really like the character of the people and you kind of self-select to the one that you're most fit with, right? So it's like a really kind of like decentralized while complex and scalable method, I think, um, without wanting to, um, um, to kind of like infiltrate the whole thing uh, with one set of values.